Hey everyone, konnichiwa, Nikki Young here, back with my new true crime podcast, Serial Napper. So tonight we are taking it back to Japan. As many of you know, I currently live in Tokyo, and as soon as I heard about this case, I knew I had to cover it. It involves something that I come across every single day. I gave you guys a little bit of a hint over on my Facebook page. I don't know if you saw it, but if you haven't seen it yet, I suggest you head over there and check it out because even if you can't figure out the clue, it's a pretty cool video if I do say so myself. Some of you may have guessed it already, but tonight's case has been dubbed the vending machine murders. I don't think that you can really understand just how big of a part of daily life vending machines are over here in Japan until you've actually been here and visited. Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do when I have to go back to Canada or end up in another country and I can't find a vending machine within 30 seconds of wanting one. It sounds silly and overdramatic, but it's true. There is a vending machine on nearly every single block here in Tokyo. They're down alleyways, they're in front of convenience stores, which seems a little bit redundant, doesn't it? Since you can just go into a store and buy a drink. Especially since many of the convenience stores here are open 24 hours. But if you're feeling a little less chatty than usual and don't want to have to talk to a human being you might choose the vending machine over the cashier. (laughs) Um, I've done it many, many times. Being an introvert myself, it's a nice option (laughs) not having to talk to someone to get a drink every time I want one. At slightly over 5 million people nationwide, Japan has the highest density of vending machines worldwide. There is approximately one vending machine per every 23 people here, according to the Japan Vending Machine Manufacturers Association. Annual sales of vending machines total more than $60 billion. So hey, if you're in Japan and you're looking to make a little money on the side, maybe go get yourself a vending machine. Now, I found some really cool vending machines out here. Um, The one on my Facebook page features the pizza vending machine in Hiroshima, and it just so happens to be my favorite. That pizza (laughs) took a total of three minutes to make by machine. I got to watch it being cooked as I stood on the side of the road, and it was actually really, really yummy. It came out in a cardboard box, and (laughs) there was a little side drawer that I opened up, and it had a pizza cutter in there, a disposable one, of course. Um, napkins, and everything that you could possibly need for pizza. But besides soft drinks, coffee, and tea, you can find cigarettes. Yeah, you can literally grab cigarettes from a vending machine. No ID required. You can get candy, soup, and I mean like hot, ready-to-eat soup. Like, comes in a can or a container, and it's hot and ready-to-eat right off the bat kind of soup. You can even get sake and beer, although I've heard they've lowered the number of machines available for those, and I actually haven't been able to find one myself. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, sake vending machine, one of mine and Matt's favorite places to go for date night is a little sake vending machine spot. So you literally put in a couple hundred yen, which is like three or four dollars Canadian, And you can choose from a wide selection of different sake. And you put your cup underneath and the little vending machine will fill your cup with sake and you're good to go. So, what do vending machines have to do with tonight's case? This is an unsolved murder mystery that happened just before I was born in 1985. Twelve people were poisoned from vending machine drinks, and the perpetrator has never been found. They got away with it. These cases started to pop up around the same time one of the big health drink companies here put out a marketing promotion to attract new customers. Oronamin Sea Drink, produced by Otsuka Chemical Holdings, is a carbonated beverage available in Japan containing isoleucine, and many other essential amino acids, as well as many vitamins like vitamin B2, 
vitamin B6, and vitamin C. Basically, this promotion of ornament C promoted to the public would involve programming the vending machines to dispense a free bottle of their drink in addition to whatever drink that they had actually purchased. So the person would say, you know, select a Coke or whatever they wanted to drink on the vending machine and out would pop the Coke along with a free bottle of ornament C. Now, as I mentioned previously, this is kind of a health drink. It was mostly marketed towards salarymen and definitely attracted a certain type of demographic. So even if the bottle was free, if the person didn't want it, they would simply leave it on top of the vending machine or somewhere around the vending machine for whoever wanted it. Personally, as someone with a marketing background, this seems like a total waste of money and profit not to mention all of the waste produced, but I digress. The first victim was a 45-year-old truck driver from Fukuyama, Hiroshima, the same place I got my pizza vending machine on. On April 30th, he purchased a drink from a vending machine and out popped his drink, and I would imagine out popped one of those free Oronaman drinks as well, but he noticed an additional bottle of the health drink sitting on top of the machine. So he took both of the free drinks in addition to the original drink that he had ordered. Like I said, because of the promotion, this was quite common to see, but honestly, living in Japan where it's incredibly safe anyway, and you know, it was the 80s, I imagine he likely would have taken it anyway. He drank both drinks, and almost immediately, he got really sick, and he eventually died on May 30th, 1985. Before his death, he had been vomiting a lot, and when they analyzed his vomit, they found traces of Paraquat, which is a deadly weed killer that is actually banned in 32 countries around the world. Apparently, not in Japan. Let's break down what Paraquat can do to a human, even if it only touched the surface of the skin. It causes blistering, chemical burns, which the victim had on the insides from ingesting it. It causes rapid inflammation of tissue, and it basically burns holes through the victim's throat. Not to be extremely graphic, but... This guy suffered a lot, and it would have been an agonizing death, although at least swift. The other drinks in the vending machine were tested, and none of the other drinks had been spiked. Basically, the case was closed, and police had no idea that this was not going to be an isolated incident. There would be 11 more deaths until the whole thing stopped. Now, I have a list of the victims here. Nothing really stands out in terms of their demographics. These were completely random acts. And I think it's safe to say that no one was especially targeted here. But because I always think it's incredibly important to remember the victims, I'd still like to run through who they were. So in addition to the truck driver, on September 11th in Osaka, a 52-year-old man purchased a bottle of Aronamin C and found another of the same inside the machine's dispensing slot. He consumed both and unfortunately passed away on September 14th, just a few days later. Traces of Paraquat were found in the beverage remnants. On September 12th in Mie, 22-year-old college student purchased a bottle of real gold which is an energy drink from a vending machine. A bottle of the same drink was found already sitting in the dispensing slot, and so he consumed both at home. He perished on the 14th of September, just two days later. The perp seemed to have switched things up, or maybe he ran out of Paraquat, I'm not sure, because the poison used in this case was Dequat, not Paraquat. However, as all other aspects of this incident were similar to the other 11 deaths by Paraquat, this case is still counted as part of the same thing, the same string of killings. On September 19th, in Fukui, 
30-year-old man consumed a can of cola he found underneath the vending machine and eventually perished in hospital on the 22nd of September. Analysis of his stomach contents and remnants of the cola showed traces of Paraquat. So it wasn't just the Oromanin sea bottles that were being contaminated. This dude dared to spike a cola. September 20th in Miyazaki. A 45-year-old man intends to purchase a drink, but he finds two bottles of real gold, that energy drink, in the dispensing slot instead. He consumes both at home, and he dies on September 22nd. Traces of Paraquat were found in the beverage remnants. On September 23rd in Osaka, a 50-year-old man finds two bottles of Ronamin C in a vending machine dispensing slot. He consumes both two days later and dies on the 7th of October. So he, he must have been in agonizing pain for a little bit of time. Traces of Paraquat were found in both of the beverages. October 5th in Saitama, the death of a 44-year-old is pretty much identical. It was the same drink, Aronamin C, same as the previous. The victim died on the 21st of October, and traces of Paraquat were found in the beverage. October 15th in Nara, which is literally my favorite place on earth because I get to go and just basically be harassed by deer all day. A 69-year-old finds two unnamed drinks in the dispensing slot, so we don't know exactly which drinks he did consume. And he consumed both of them at home, passed away on November 13th. Traces of Paraquat were found in both beverages. October 21st in Miyagi, a 55-year-old man passes away in much a similar fashion after consuming an unnamed drink from a vending machine. October 28th, it's Osaka again. A 50-year-old man dies after drinking an Oronamin C he found in the dispensing slot of a vending machine. November 7th. Guys, these are so many deaths. November 7th in Saitama again. A 42-year-old man purchases an Oronamin C and takes two additional Oronamin C bottles he finds in the dispensing slot, consuming both at home and eventually dying on the 16th of November. Now, this brings us to our final victim. On November 17th, in Saitama, a 17-year-old girl purchases an unnamed drink from a vending machine, but takes a cola she finds in the dispensing slot. So once again, they're spiking a cola. A week later, she passes away and traces of Paraquat were found in the beverage remnants. So whoever did this didn't leave it to just one city in Japan, but it seems to be mostly the southwestern region. And he spiked a lot of machines, a lot of machines. The deaths all seem to happen soon one after another. The majority of killings took place between September and November of 1985, with some isolated incidences before and after. Signs were posted up at vending machines warning people not to take drinks unless they were directly dispensed from the machine. The police worked tirelessly to find any clues that would lead them to the culprit, yet the murders continued for almost two months before just suddenly stopping. The cases remain unsolved. Due to a lack of security cameras in that era, I mean, it was the 80s, and the very little evidence that was found, the perpetrator remains unidentified to this day. It's also unclear whether the murders were committed by multiple individuals or a single individual who was acting alone. And while this specific perp or perps seemed to have suddenly stopped, there were copycats to follow. For example, someone had left tainted containers of milk in schools in Mie Prefecture, which is like really disgusting. At that point, you're targeting children. 
Another two copycat poisonings took place in Tokyo, where police were notified of drinks tainted with lime and sulfur. And in unfortunately similar fashion, the perpetrators were never caught. After this scare, some of the drink companies replaced their screw bottle caps with a one-time pull cap, which cannot be resealed after opening. I honestly haven't noticed if these type of caps still exist, but you bet your ass I'm going to be looking from now on. The case has many similarities with the Tylenol murders, which took place just three years earlier in Chicago. Seven people died from cyanide poisoning after consuming the common painkiller Tylenol. No culprit has ever been found in that case. And after the Tylenol murders, there were a series of similar drug tampering incidents, including some murders, which were said to be copycat attacks. While they were very likely not connected in any single way, I would imagine that the Tylenol murders were probably an inspiration for the vending machine murders. Also, do you guys know what Pocky is? If you don't, you're missing out. Go get your butt online and order some Pocky right now. It's a Japanese snack created by the Glico Company. It's basically like a pretzel type stick covered with chocolate or matcha or strawberry or any other sort of yumminess that you can imagine. Anyway, prior to the vending machine murders, in 1984, another mysterious criminal sparked fear by tampering with our beloved yummy Japanese snacks. Dubbing themselves the Monster with 21 Faces, which was a name borrowed from a villain in a series of Japanese detective novels, this band of extortionists sent their first letter on May 10, 1984, to the Glico Company and would continue to send threatening letters to various food companies and news agencies. In these letters, they taunted the police and they detailed alleged locations where candies were going to be poisoned with cyanide. As you can imagine, claims and threats like this sent the public into pure panic. These letters continued well into 1985 when the vending machine murders began to happen. An excerpt from one of these such letters reads, Dear dumb police officers, don't tell a lie. All crimes begin with a lie, as we say in Japan. Don't you know that? Another taunting letter was sent to Koshian Police Station. Why don't you keep it to yourself, it read. You seem to be at a loss, so why not let us help you? We'll give you a clue. We entered the factory by the front gate. The typewriter we used is Pan Writer. P-A-N Writer. The plastic container used was a piece of street garbage. Signed, the monster with 21 faces. Were the two connected? Was it the same group? Doubtful. The monster with 21 faces seemed to have been a much more detailed planner, and they had a bigger involvement than the vending machine murderer, who seemed like they just wanted to kill as many people as possible. In fact, the only victim of the monster with 21 faces was police superintendent Yamamoto, who was so stressed out about this case that he committed suicide by setting himself on fire, to which the monster with 21 faces responded with, We decided to forget about tormenting food companies. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad guy's life. <sighs> And there you have it. <laughs> Will these two cases make me want to stop snacking on Pocky and buying sugary vending machine drinks? Stay tuned, but the answer is likely no. I <laughs> love, 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 love Japanese snacks and Japanese vending machines. I would basically die without them. I hoped you liked tonight's episode. Honestly, I felt like we needed a bit of a palate cleanser. And while it's still extremely sad that 12 people were randomly killed by this pathetic piece of wet lettuce, 
at least it's still a bit far removed from where we are today. And as far as true crime goes, it's a little bit more PG-13. If you like this episode or this podcast, I would super appreciate your reviews. Seriously, guys, it's pretty much the only thing that keeps me going while I try to get through homeschooling my seven-year-old. So go leave me a review on whatever podcasting app you're listening on. I'm so, so, so thankful for your support. If you want to reach out, I love your ideas. Keep them coming, guys. I know some of you have sent me some of your ideas for upcoming cases, and I have a long list of amazing cases I want to cover, but please keep them coming. So reach out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Serial Napper. That's S-E-R-I-A-L-N-A-P-P-E-R. If you're on Apple, you can search for me. Just search Serial Napper or on Spotify. And hey, you don't need a premium to listen to podcasts. Search Serial Napper. I'm also now on Twitter. I'm seriously tweeting my little heart out about anything true crime, anything spooky. Do you hear me? Tweet, tweet. If you're on Twitter, you can find me over there at twitter.com slash serial underscore napper. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.